thwarted up this day. What a great turnout. I'm Stu Magnuson. I'm the author of The Last American Highway, A Journey Through Time down US Route 83. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, some of the descendants and uh, other people, and I'll, I'll say a few words a little bit later. Uh, but right now we're going to start with invocation by uh, the Reverend Khadija Mateen, granddaughter of Goldie Walker Hayes. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Stand on the X. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to give thanks for a great day and an incredible gathering. Creator and sustainer of all that is good and will ever be. Accept our thanks for this day and all of its blessings. We ask that you guide us in this new way and this new renewal of our community. Bringing old acquaintances through spirit and ancestors, through memories, to connect with those who have opened their home to welcome us in this very special way. In our journey, we focused on our past, we rediscovered our roots, and in so doing, opened new ways to see this place, to see ourselves, to see our neighbors, and to make new friends. And for this, we are eternally grateful. We are most appreciative of this gathering, and we are especially thankful for everyone who came to help us in this tribute to all the ways that we are. We give thanks in God's name. Amen. Amen. Next, we're going to hear from uh, Ralph Ettinger, the uh, Cherry County, and I believe also the Thomas County Historical Society. And uh, he's going to welcome you all to Cherry County. I am completely overwhelmed by the size of this crowd. I wish to thank everyone for turning out. I, I, just, I just completely leave me almost lost for words. In thinking about what I was going to say, I keep it brief. My father used to coyote hunt all over that country horseback. And he said when anybody up there saw him and said, come to eat, he went to eat because he said they were all good cooks. And with that, I will turn the microphone to the next. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, now, D. Adams, uh, representing the Nebraska State Historical Society, would like to say a few words. Good morning. I'm pleased to be here on this beautiful day. Um, I love historical markers. They tell us a story. They connect us with our past. And they are also the most recognizable symbol of your state historical society. Uh, there are 500 and some markers across the state, and I think this is such an appropriate, wonderful way to honor the settlement of DeWitty. And it's been a wonderful story and one of my favorites since the 70s, the first time Vicki Troxell Harris told me about the DeWitty settlement. And I've been to several of her presentations about that. And uh, welcome, have a great day. And now there's a permanent marker to dedica dedicated to keep everyone with DeWitty in their memory and learn about it if they have never heard. So congratulations to all of you. Starts with an idea, put some money together, put the idea together, and here we are today. So thank you. Well, it's uh, my turn. Uh, so I guess I'll just kind of start by uh, telling my personal story, if you haven't heard it. My uh, roots are in Stapleton, and uh, when I was in high school, I picked up a copy of Nebraska Land Magazine and an art article about an African-American settlement near Brownlee, Nebraska, a place I'd been through uh, a couple times, pheasant hunting with my dad and my grandpa, and it completely blew my mind. Because as a child growing up in the 70s, I was fed a diet of Westerns with nothing but white people and Native Americans, and the Native Americans were always the bad guys, of course. And uh, I just had always been fascinated uh, with uh, this settlement. So let's fast forward 25 years, 30 years. Uh, I came up with the idea for this book that I would write 
uh, kind of a hybrid history and, and travel book about Highway 83 and the history found alongside it. And the first thing that popped into my head was Like DeWitty. So when I got to the chapter uh, to write that, that story, it was really one of the most important things I wanted to really write and do a good job on as an author. So then I was doing a lot of research on Highway 83 and driving up and down in past year and, and thinking, you know, why isn't there a historical marker for DeWitty? There really ought to be. Who's responsible? You know, and, and I started looking into it towards the end of the writing the book. I got a hold of Catherine Meehan kind of late in the research, and I just uh, suddenly shot her a message on Facebook, said, hey, don't you think there ought to be a historical marker for DeWitty? And she said, well, yeah. So I said, well, what do you got to do to get, in, get that? So I just called the society, and they said, well, you got to apply. I said, great. We applied. They were all for it, and um, then they said, now please send us a check for $5,100. So I've never done any fundraising before in my life, but I figured, okay, let's start off. Uh, so there's a lot of people I want to thank that made it happen. Now I'm going to go to my notes. Uh, right away I decided i got to contact the Cherry County Historical Society. Ralph Edinger, you just heard from, Joyce Muirhead. Right away they approved it, and not only did they uh, think it was a fantastic idea, uh, they sent me a couple checks, the very first donations. And uh, so i really like to thank the Cherry County Historical Society uh, Board. Uh, and then, uh, then we went on to the Nebraska State Historical Society. Teresa Fatimi, James Potter, they're basically responsible. Uh, they kind of shepherded me through the process. And uh, a little bit of back and forth with James on the wording, but we settled on what we see here. So uh, then on to the fundraising. Uh, I've decided first to do the traditional thing. Just We opened an account at Security First Bank at Valentine, and people could just drop off checks or cash or whatever or mail it in. And it got a lot of publicity, and a lot of people did that. I really regret not asking them to write down the names of those who donated. But I know a lot of people probably here stopped in and uh, dropped off a $20 bill or something. We really appreciate it. And uh, we got a long way there, and then I took it uh, to the online crowdsourcing sites and uh, uh, a lot of my cousins. So we had a lot of different communities chipped in for this. And that's what I think is really great about it. We, of course, have the descendants of DeWitty who uh, sent their money in to market. We got the Historical Society. Citizens, people uh, of Cherry County donated money. We got some publicity in the state newspapers. So we got people who just love history, uh, wanted to chip in and send some money. I, of course, cajoled my friends and family into donating money. Thank you. Some of them are here today. They made it. Uh, thanks to my cousins, mom, dad, everyone. Hey, mom, write me a check for $100. Thank you. Uh, so we got there. State Department of Roads did a great job. What a beautiful sight. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. Uh, I'm just so happy that people will pull over here and maybe take a walk and take a look at the North Loop River. They were down here this morning putting the finishing touches just after the crack of dawn. Thanks to them. So if you don't know, you do now that there's a potluck afterwards in Brownlee. The community of Brownlee population 15 or so as the sign says <laughs> that's gone all out and they're you're all invited for a potluck afterwards uh i was there earlier they're, they're setting up this morning and uh, thanks to uh ann manning warren sunny hannah the lees the whites who've come here from omaha and all the community of brown lee and the, all the people around here for that and uh I'm not going to talk to you. I'm going to let the descendants talk about the, the people of Brownlee. Uh, I just want to say a couple things. Uh, about a month ago, the Omaha World Herald reporter called, uh, emailed me and said, can you give me some quotes and why you think this is an important place to mark? And I thought about it long and hard, and I, I wrote some quotes, and then uh, apparently they ended up on the cutting room floor. They never made it in the paper. But I'm going to read one of them that I... Uh, that I uh, I wrote to him, 
And I just want to note as we stand here today, you know, the nation seems more polarized than ever. And uh, we're standing here in the second term of an African-American president. And, you know, it's seven years down the road, and maybe we're taking that for granted now, or it doesn't really seem that ordinary, but really a generation ago, that was almost unthinkable, that American people would elect a black man as president. So, here's the quote. I am glad that the marker mentions the close bond between the black settlers of DeWitty and the white residents of Brown Lee. The two communities were both isolated and on their own in the depths of the sand hills back then. Here we have the story of a mixed race couple, integrated schools, neighbors helping each other when they needed it, and two communities coming together to celebrate the quintessential American holiday, Independence Day. This should be remembered. So thank you again for coming. Uh, and next, uh, we are going to hear from Catherine Meehan. Well. But I, I'm just really gratified to see all of you here, and I know that the um, ancestors are standing around us and just really, really delighted to know that after this much time, they're remembered. I never lived in Nebraska, and I never visited Cherry County before, but I grew up with the names DeWitty and Audacious constantly in my ear. My dad, William Meehan, seemed to carry Nebraska with him. In so many ways, this feels like coming home. A question I'm often asked is why my grandparents, Charles and Hester Meehan, left Canada for Nebraska. The Browns, Crawfords, Rileys, Hatters, Giles, Robinsons, Smalls, Walkers, Emanuels, why did any of this core of the Whitty settlers leave Canada, that promised land? I suspect these Nebraska homesteaders from the north may have felt arms shoving them from a once welcoming bosom. With the end of the Civil War and emancipation, some European Canadians felt it was time for the refugees to leave, even though some had never lived in the United States and their families had been in Canada for a century or more. When the United States was using the Homestead Act to open its western frontiers, Canada enacted the Dominion Lands Act in an effort to populate western Canada. I've read that as many as 600,000 United States citizens took up homesteads in Canada, but the people of African descent who Canada once sheltered were not welcome in its western regions. So these Canadians made their way to Cherry County, to Brownlee, then to Whitty. The Canadians and so many other families came. Curtis, Ford, Price, Miles, Stith, Burkhart, Nance, Hayes, Conrad, Hannes, Spies, Morgan, Boyd, Williams, Murphy, and many I don't know to name. The reasons these families settled here are certainly as varied and complex as the number of families involved. At a time in American history when racial tension boiled over in places like Atlanta in 1906, Greenwood, Oklahoma in 1921, and Rosewood, Florida in 1923, there was some chemistry that developed between black and white families here in Cherry County that caused Nebraska to coalesce in the minds and hearts of these people as the place to call home. They came here mostly to farm on what I understand is cattle land, and the land and climate would have none of it. But the Nebraska atmosphere that existed between neighbors suckered these families. I heard my father and cousins comment that there was no prejudice out here, that people were just na people, and neighbors were neighbors. I've often seen it written that the witty settlers failed. Yes, crops did fail. Dust devastated those who tried to hang on, those who couldn't or wouldn't turn to cattle. Perhaps they and other homesteaders failed the land, and the land in turn failed them. But the fact that we are here today tells a, to a story of success, not failure. Paul may well have been speaking to the DeWitty settlers when he addressed the Galatians. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. It doesn't say fail not, it says faint not. And the DeWitty homesteaders did not faint. Today is their due season. There is a saying that the two most important things a parent can give their children are roots 
and wings. We're standing here today, testament to the roots, roots that hold you to a task, roots that hold you to a task once you've set your hand to it, roots that show kindness and compassion to your fellow man, roots of tenacity and faith and humor, knowing that the test is not about success or failure, but about doing your best, and wings, wings that carried James Emanuel, grandson of Joshua Doss Emanuel, to become one of the 20th century's finest poets, wings that would carry others through childhood dreams to become doctors and nurses, lawyers and teachers, soldiers and farmers and preachers and actors, whatever they could imagine. The accomplished and thriving lives of DeWitty's descendants throughout the United States and across the globe are testament to those wings. To the ancestors, those Sand Hills homesteaders of both DeWitty and Brownlee, I say thank you. Thank you to all their descendants, to the Nebraska State Historical Society and the Cherry County Historical Society Museum, those who have worked to see this project to fruition. A special thank you to Stu McNusson for his amazing work to honor ancestors not his own. There are so many other stories he could have chosen to highlight. And thank you to the Br town of Brownlee for the exceptionally warm welcome home. I've been asked to read one of my dad's poems. Um, it's his mental snapshot of the bridge that spanned the Loop River between Char uh, Charles and Ed Meehan's property. This is the memory of a homesteader's kid, the footbridge over the river, written in 1914 uh, when dad was 17 years old. Almost finished. <laughs> the old footbridge over the river was carried out in the long, long ago, in the whirl of the North Loop's waters and the rush of a great ice flow. 1910, in the spring, it was built there by those who heeded the call for a safe way to cross the Loop River for the use and convenience of all. Section 3 in the far northwest corner where the river is narrow and deep in Township 27, Range 30, in Old Cherry is where memories creep. Memories linked with a pioneer footbridge with a walkway of wire wove with planks and a wire on each side to take hold of and the ends two feet clear of the banks. 'Twas a pleasure to stand in the middle of the bridge as it swings to and fro till it seemed like a boat sailing smoothly, so swiftly the loop's waters flow. Oh, 'twas great just to linger for hours with the water almost to the planks and watch the sand boil in the water when the river went over its banks. It was used as a springboard by swimmers on many a long summer's day, for although it was handy and useful, it was also a nice place to play. By the bridge, the brush grew to the water and trickling springs could be seen. The grim sand hills stood guard all around it as it stood by itself or the stream. It is now in the heartless forever. Into the great misty past it is gone. Like the lives of great men is the footbridge. For though dead, it forever lives on. By William H. Meehan, 17 years of age. Thank you. Next, uh, I know there are a lot of people here who uh, remember uh, Goldie Walker Hayes and maybe even some students. Yep. And so uh, Joyce Ann Gray, granddaughter, is going to speak next. Here you go. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to say welcome everybody and thank you for being here. And Sorry. it's a blessed day. It really is. I am Joyce Ann Gray, a retired U.S. Army veteran and family historian. And uh, this has been a real humbling time for me. So please bear with me because this is, this is great. It really is. I'm accompanied by my older brother Bill from California. My sister Khadija, who did the invocation, she's from New York. My two grandchildren, Jacob and Leah, and um, we're, we're really feeling great to be here. Lynn Messersmith and her family have opened up their doors and, and offered their hospitality to us, and it's been absolutely fabulous. I speak on behalf of our family and other descendants in remembrance of all of our ancestors 
just to name a few, the Browns, Walkers, Hatter, Rileys, Emanuels, and so many others that couldn't make it today. Uh, quite a few I've been in contact with, and they send me thanks and, and happiness about our occasion today. I want to acknowledge that it was Catherine Meehan Blount who first suggested the idea of a reunion of the descendants, possibly happening one day here by D. Whitty. And Stu, thank you very much for spearheading the march to make things happen today. Uh, let's see. I'm sure with all who have spoken or will speak, most everyone has been thanked and recognized for their contribution and participation, so I won't belabor that point. All efforts of support are much appreciated indeed, and we thank each and every one for their help and their, their just coming together. About D. Witty, audacious. Although, although the town didn't survive and the land may have reclaimed itself, the legacy of those homesteaders who came before us is evident by the descendants who stand with us today. We have Fern's daughter. This is uh, Goldie Walker's sister's child, sister. right? And um, her granddaughter is here. We have the descendant, direct descendant of the um, postmaster, D. Witty. His descendants are here presence today, Delbert and his son Bryson. And we have uh, Walker's, one of his first daughters, <laughs> grandson is here today. So the driving force behind every plow and every nail driven, every side wall built was with one purpose in mind. Not to build a lasting farming town, but to be the springboard for their children and generations to come. Each family ensured that education, religious, and academic teaching was primary and the, re and the reinforcement to choose their own direction was indeed encouraged for they taught to believe they could grasp whatever star they reached for and freedom to seek out adventures that beckoned their bright and spirited minds. I want to name a few to lay credence to their vision. You have James Andrew Emanuel, born in 1921, who became a renowned poet, educator, and critic. He published more than a dozen volumes of his poetry, and he received his higher education at Howard University in 1950, his master's in Northwestern in 53, and his doctorate in English and comparative literature from Columbia University while he was teaching at City College of New York. The various buildings that once demonstrated his father, Joshua Emanuel's skill in architecture and builder in Dawson and then again in Dewitty, <coughs> stands, uh, I think we still have one building that stands. The Rand family worked their land next to the Small and Robinson Guild Washington families, not far from the Emanuels, Hatter, Stiffs, and Riley and Walkers, forming this, a co-op of sorts that ensured that everyone would benefit from their labors. No one went without food, clothing, or shelter. They took care of each other. I remember my mother and father talking about how there would be barn raisings. And everybody from Brownlee, everybody in the, commu the, the surrounding communities came together and helped build those barns and those schools. We have Amos <coughs> Walker became a principal at the Lincoln School in St. Joseph, Missouri. We have mm -hmm. Karina um, Orlean Williams. She graduated from college and married John Williams. We have Envy Jane who graduated from college. We have William, Robert William, who became a freight elevator operator. Margaret, whose mother was Sarah Kersey, she graduated and married Christopher, Christopher Stiff. Now, from that union came um, Reverend Stiff, who was the author of two books. So we, we're doing pretty good here so far. <laughs> George Riley, Father William King Riley, he was an educator and director of school um, school district here in Nebraska. Albert Franklin Riley Sr. was a gaming forester for 35 years at your Nairobi uh, Wildlife Refuge. So Fernella and Goldie, they were teachers. They graduated from Kearney County, Nebraska and Black Hills Teachers College in Spearfish, South Dakota. Both sisters became highly respected teachers in Cherry County 
teaching in school district 164 and their half brother George was the director. Sweet Bueller, daughter of, of um, William Walker and Charlotte Hatter, went to Kansas to become a nurse because her uh, cousin was one of the founders of the first black hospital in, in Kansas. That was Dr. Samuel Tompkins. So she became a nurse and a skilled masseuse therapist and became very well known. She And I found out about her because she was in a lot of newspaper articles. So this is how we found out because the newspapers back in those days told you everything about everybody. <laughs> who went to dinner at whose house and who's coming to visit and who took the pigs to the market. So I got a lot of news that way. And then last but but definitely not least, our grandmother, Goldie Walker Hayes. Goldie, in 1947, was elected as the Cherry County Rural Teachers Delegate to the General Assembly. She went on to North South Dakota and became a school principal in a four-room building, which was huge. A kitchen, her office, and two classrooms. That's <laughs> impressive. <laughs> What's impressive about her being elected to the General Assembly is a testament to you folks and how you relate to one another. She was the only black candidate and she won the election. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. <laughs> Contrary to various accountings of the reasons for the demise of this town, D. Witty, renamed Audacious later, centered their energy, vision, and struggles to achieve the American dream. They achieved their mission and this is a fitting memorial for all their struggles. Remembering D. Woody pays homage to those who confronted barriers in the pre-Civil War United States, in Canada, and in Nebraska Sand Hills. And we've mentioned before that our family has come, quite a few of our families have come from Canada. Well, that was a 1,700-mile trek from Buxton, Canada, all the way here to the Sand Hills of Nebraska. And they didn't do it by car. <laughs> All plain. All plain. <laughs> That's right. They're, and we went on a wagon ride yesterday. Lord! <laughs> I bow. I bow to my ancestors. <laughs> I really do. Oh, my goodness. So, <laughs> I got a hot tub face of me when I get home. So today, April 11th, 2016, in hopes that our words have been heard, we, your descendants, friends, neighbors, have come in honor of you all. We are here today to say thank you for planting the seeds of our own trees, and we're here to demonstrate that we cherish the legacy, we appreciate the struggles, the pain, the tears, and to share the joy in knowing that we have honored your being. 